Hi, and welcome to My Friend the Rainbow Circle, episode 49. So, <clears throat> this is a culmination of a couple of different things I've been talking about, um, and this functions as a good example of a lot of the concepts, and also the theme of dogs almost knocking over my camera. Don't knock over my camera, please. So anyway, <laughs> so a couple of things I've been talking about. I talked about my uh, parataxis and, uh, uh, paradox and parataxis exercise, it's a good way to start stories. And I've been talking about first lines, opening lines, um, in a couple of different episodes. Um, and a great place to look for both of those things, the whole concept of how do you actually start a story and what is a really good, effective opening line. You can, you can see in Harold Pinter, Harold Pinter's, um, plays. Um, and he had a technique for starting his plays that I've, uh, I think says a lot about the, the actual process of starting a story, you know, and it's his individual process, and that's a good process. Um, and it's somewhat similar to my paradox and parataxis uh, exercise. Um, but uh, what he does, according to him, what he does is he um, just imagines two characters and he just lets them talk. And I think that's, that speaks to the center of the rainbow circle, the whole idea of, uh, you know, ultimate subjecthood of the characters. Uh, getting them as far away from overt or authorial control as possible and just letting them, just from the very beginning, letting them just live and speak and shape their story. And it's a process of discovering a story. So, um, like the other day, I, I, I talked about my Paradox and Paradoxes exercise because um, I was going to go talk to a school about it. Um, and just as a starting point, just, um, you know, giving it to these high school kids and saying, here are two things that don't really seem to belong together. Let's figure out the mystery. There's a parataxis part of it. Let's figure out the mystery of why they're together and come up with a character based on that. Uh, and, you know, and, and Harold Pinter really starts the dialogue because he's a playwright, but, you know, you could start with something like that. You could, you could say, these things don't seem to belong together. Why are they together? So it's a process of self-discovery, and that's one of the great joys of, of writing one of the great joys of writing, finding creation in chaos, and the dogs are about to knock over the camera again. So, um, finding creation in, in chaos, and creation and chaos are not opposites necessarily. Uh, chaos could be a fertile, uh, a primordial ooze out of which this, and that's one of my dad's phrases. One of my dad's phrases, primordial ooze. We talked about, we did a, a project on uh, Titan, and he kept using that word. That was my dad. Um, the primordial ooze of ancient Earth exists on the moon of Titan. And so something like that, just putting two things that don't seem to belong together, that's that sort of primordial ooze of the early Earth that, that births, uh, you know, all kinds of life out of it. Uh, and that's the, the ideal of starting a story or a play or whatever. Um, you know, what is giving the characters life and just discovering who they are instead of forcing them to be... Um, you know, be a certain way. And I think that's where, that's something that kills a lot of stories, is, is forcing them to be something, forcing characters to be something that they're not. Um, whereas, and I would say, you know, it's not a universal bad, it's just forcing a character to be something they aren't can just um, kill the progression of a story, especially in the early creative stages. Um, so what Harold Pinter would do... Um, is he would um, just let, he, he would take that process and make it as pure as possible. And not to say controlling a character's or setting up a situation is necessarily, necessarily always bad. You can still have lively characters with lots of authorial control, um, but the authorial control is effectively working against the characters being living characters. Um, so you have to sort of negotiate that. And that's the thing about the rainbow circle, it's a spectrum, so <clears throat> you have the pure primordial life of the character versus um, authorial control, keeping it orderly. Uh, and so sometimes the best place to balance that is in the schematic level. And so I talk a lot about the schematic level, things like genre conventions, um, and that's, you know, a rich place to, to, um, work on. And I do want to talk, I do want to talk 
more about comics. In the next, next episode, I'll talk more about comics. Uh, and I'll probably talk about Jack Kirby. Um, but that's the thing about comics. Comics are delights because they um, have that pure creative drive, living drive. Um, and they have some authorial control, but it, it tends to you know, be isolated in that schematic level where it's internal rule systems. And Jack uh, Kirby had this amazing imagination uh, and he set up all these rule systems for his all of these amazing things that he created. But it's the the internal rule system is a is functionally to take the chaos and give it some sort of control that's really just intrinsic to the story. Um, and that's great. I love to work with that kind of control. It's lots and lots and lots of fun. But on the flip side of that. Not necessarily flip side, but another just really rich thing to work with is not having that control. Um, and so a lot of Harold Pinter is somewhat similar to something like a David Lynch, uh, David Lynch movie. It doesn't seem like a David Lynch movie at first. Usually Harold Pinter story, uh, Harold Pinter plays will start off seemingly a fairly normal sort of dynamic between characters, and there will be lots and lots of subtextual, ten sub subtextual tension. There will be some sort of mysterious air to it, but then it will develop uh, as like a David Lynch story, uh, where it turns out it's much more messed up than than what you expected it to be. So, like one of my favorite David Lynch, well, my favorite, probably my favorite movie is Inland Empire. Um, but one of my favorite David Lynch moments is when the Polish uh, woman is is telling Laura Dern's character this whole fairy tale. And it's so there's so much subtext, there's so much intensity to it. And you, as the movie progresses, you kind of have to try to figure out what was, how does that fairy tale um, apply to the rest of the movie? And it's not easy. Um, and I kind of don't want to figure that out. That's sort of what I was talking about with the bowl of petunias in, in Hitchhiker's Guide. I don't really want to know why the Bull of Petunia said, um, not, a, not again. Um, if I knew, that would, that would shift from that more primordial sort of ecstatic, uh, visceral impulse to, you know, my mysterious, uh, air to it, to something more schematic. So, you know, and that's how Harold Penner plays tend to go, um, is it'll have all these shifts in you, and it creates this really intense sort of air of mystery, um, that, you know, you, you kind of have to try to figure out what's actually going on. Um, and it's really, really disturbing in so many ways. And he's great at dialogue, and he's well known for dialogue with lots of really, really intense subtext to it. This is my, my comprehensive Harold Pinter collection. And I don't have some of his classics, because I'm always giving books away. Not to brag about always giving books away. That's just my principle about books. If, if I say, oh, you would, you would love this Harold Pinter book. You know, you would have, you would love this Harold Pinter play. You, you know, you would, uh, this could show you lots about writing or whatever, or this fits your personality or something like that. I'll just give the book away. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's just my principle about books. I love collecting books, of course, but you know, why do I have on the one hand, I love them as collector's pieces, but on the other hand, why do I why do I actually why do I actually need to keep them? If I've read them once, why do I actually need to keep them? Or if I'm never going to read them, why do I actually need to keep them? So there's a push and pull there. So I'm constantly giving them away. So I don't have I don't have my I don't have the birthday party. I gave that to my friend Will. Um, I don't have uh, I don't have old times. I don't even know what happened to old times. Old times is probably my favorite one. Um, very intense. Very complicated. Um, very hard to piece together piece and by the end of that one you're you just ask yourself is this character speaking alive or dead and what does life mean <laughs> what does death mean um it's just an amazing play birthday party is great it's really wacky but uh it's really great and a lot of his early play i had a whole collection of his early plays um like he had one called the room which is awesome. He had one called um, Slight Ache, which is awesome. There's one called The Dumb Waiter, which is awesome. I had a collection of all of those, and I don't know what happened to that book. Um, 
So I'll give them away, and I'll, then I'll totally forget where I gave them away. Uh, so this is the remaining um, of the really famous ones. Oh, his major, major plays. The only ones I have left are The Homecoming. I'm going to do my booktube duty and actually show the, show the covers. The Homecoming. Of, the, of these, this is my favorite one. Um, and probably my favorite, uh, I have a really sentimental attachment to The Birthday Party. Um, and I've always called that one my favorite, but it sort of shifts. Um, birthday party is amazing, but, um, it is a lot wackier. Um, this one is a whole lot more complicated in so many different ways. Um, interesting, what I talked about, um, I talked about male gaze, and that's, that's intense and complicated and crazy and wild in this one. Um, the whole idea of female subjecthood and objecthood is just intense and crazy in that way. Um, the other, the caretaker, the caretaker, I have, I have just the, um, the, um, the version you would use the, in, uh, in actually German display service. If, if I were to ever put this on, that, that was sort of a vague dream at one point, is that I would, you know, put on plays, and that's why I have so many plays. I don't know how, how and when or why or how that would ever, this, this is the part of the video that's for my, my kids and my grandkids in the event of my untimely death, a la Michael Keaton in, in, uh, in my life. Um, but... That was one of the vague dreams your father and grandfather had, um, of one day having a theater and putting on plays. I don't know. I seriously doubt that will ever manifest, but that's all right. So many dreams to <laughs> die. That's a very Harold Pinter sort of a thing to think. The death of the dream. Um, oh, and then the other one. The other one is Betrayal, which I think is, um deeply overrated, you know, a lot of people will say, this is the best of all the Harold Pinter plays, and I, I just never really, really liked it at all, and that's just a personal opinion. A lot of these I'm not as familiar with. Um, one of the reasons I didn't give them away, because I don't know them as well, so I can't say, this is the perfect play for you. Um, so I have Moonlight, which I haven't read yet, but, um, Death, etc., which is a collection of poems and plays. It has a lot, of, a lot of really short plays. Party Time and New World Order. Um, the Hot House I also haven't read yet. It seems really interesting, uh, for sure. Um, monologue, monologue, this is a first edition also. This is, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how to place this one, because you, cause I'm, I don't know the history of this one. Um, it's an odd one out. Um, it's 1973, so stylistically I'm not even sure where it really fits. Um, like his, his early plays, he would do a lot of just straight up um, more absurdist style. You know, he's, he's considered one of the absurdist. Not my favorite name for a group, but one of my favorite groups, but not my favorite name for a group. Martin Eslin sort of lumped them all together. I have a lot of problems with calling them that. However, <laughs> he was lumped with uh, a lot of the absurdists, like Ionesco and, and Beckett and all of them. Um, so the early ones have a lot more of that sort of quality, where just crazy things will show up. Um, and he has some wackier ones, like the Dumbwaiter. Dumbwaiter's kind of wacky. Um, uh, you know, it's fun. It's, a, it's tons of fun. Um... And a slight ache, you know, it's, there's some wacky stuff to that one. Um, and the room has nothing to do with, um, with any of the film version, uh, film, films called Room or The Room. Um, that was a bit confusing. Uh, when Tommy Wiseau's movie became so popular, I was like, wait a second, that's a Harold Pinter play. Um, that Harold Pinter play is wacky, but it's not wacky in that same way. Um, but then he's, he sort of settled into... A more intensely what you might call realistic, even though, um, you know, the way things pan out aren't necessarily what I would call realistic. So something like The Homecoming, where you don't have 
weird creatures or supernatural forces or anything like that. You don't have just really, really out there dialogue, like the birthday party, you know, the interrogators in the birthday party. That whole interrogation scene just gets really, really wacky. Uh, the homecoming is complicated, very, very complicated. Um, it's hard to even really describe what even goes on in that one. Uh, but yeah, plays like The Caretaker, um, The Caretaker uh, 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 and Homecoming, sort of that middle period. Later on in his life, uh, and then he did Betrayal, and then and Betrayal is much more realistic. It's about an affair, and there's nothing really all of that, all that supernatural about it. There's nothing really just totally out there about it. It's much more realistic, hence why I think it's overrated, but a lot of people love it m the most. Um, a lot of his later plays, and that's, you can probably lump these two in there. Um, Party Time, The New World Order, and all the ones collected in here. They become a lot more political, um, and he, and he sort of fell into, it's sort of like at, at the end of Beckett's career, he, he shortened and shortened and shortened his plays, and they became much more sort of the nostalgic monologue, uh, sort of variety. Um, like Footfalls. I think I was talking about Footfalls at one point, and I blanked on what that one's called. Um, you know, that's sort of, that's the trajectory, is moving towards Footfalls type of, type of plays. Very, very short, very intensely focused. Um, or like Not I, for example. Very, very, very minimalistic, very intensely focused. Usually very monologue heavy with lots of nostalgia in it. Uh, Pinter, his trajectory was more politi political, more interrogation based. So, you know, and interrogation was part of his style from the beginning, really. Um, you know, the birthday party, that's a, um, the most famous scene from the birthday party is this crazy interrogation. Um, but a lot of his pieces would be very interrogation based. Um, and I was, I was talking to my friend Clara, I was writing, writing a play, um, and I, I was telling her uh, her about uh, Martin McDonough being heavily influenced by that sort of style. And David Mamet, there's sort of a spectrum there of influence between um, between those those writers. Um, uh, and so that's not my, really my favorite because it's so political and that's just not something I'm interested in. I don't I, I don't love the, the, the deeply political stuff. Um, I like the absurd stuff. So uh, let me take a look at the opening lines. This is what one thing I wanted to look at. Eventually, I'll get around to that. Um, the homecoming. Um, the way it starts. I got this in two thousand three. Um, sometimes I have a date in there. Um, ooh, and the cover is coming off. <laughs> Maybe I need to get a new edition because that's unfortunate. Um, the way it starts, uh, is with Lenny and Max, and that's how he starts, as he has these two characters. Um, what have you done with the scissors, Max says. I said I'm looking for the scissors. What have you done with them? Lenny says, I'm reading the paper. Max says, not that paper. I haven't even read that paper. I'm talking about last Sunday's paper. I was just having a look at it in the kitchen. Do you hear, uh, what I'm saying? I'm talking to you. Where's the scissors? So it's such a mundane sort of opening, but it, once you read through it, it's very, very menacing. I mean, certainly in the performance, that's what I was talking about in the last episode, the performance of the actors will have a lot to do with seating the menace right from the opening. The minute the menace definitely builds and builds as the play goes on. Um, but just in those opening lines, you know, just imagine... Harold Pinder sitting down and saying, um, all right, have these two characters, what are they talking about? They're talking about scissors. Well, why are they talking about scissors? They start talking about a newspaper. So he's, you know, presumably, based on what he said, he doesn't know really what the story is about. He doesn't know what the play's about. He just has Max and Lenny sit down and um, start talking about this really mundane conversation. And then you start to discover things about them as the story progresses. Um, and so, and it ends up being, um, uh, it ends up being about, uh, Teddy, um, and Teddy coming home with his new wife, Ruth, um, 
I was directed by Peter Hall. He's a great director. Um, he's, he directed a lot of these. Uh, but Teddy and Teddy and Ruth, um, Teddy's, it's this house full of these these very macho dudes. Um, and then Teddy comes home with Ruth, and and they have this complicated sort of Teddy is the more is the weaker member of the family, um, and you get you get sort of the implication. I mean, plenty of clues that they're they're criminals of some sort. It's really ambiguous what kind of criminals they are. Um, they make all of these uh, intense, subtextually intense um, passes at Ruth. Um, and then, but by the end of it, um, it flips completely. This is kind of the wild thing about this play. It's just fascinating how, how this works. It's so menacing and you worry for Ruth, but then it just flips completely and Ruth is just dominating everyone. And by the end, um, you know, uh, like the movie version, uh, one of the movie versions, um, the one with Ian Holm is the one I've seen, um, by the end, you have all of, all of these just macho male characters are just essentially quivering on the floor and just worshipping Ruth. Um, and she's just destroyed all of them. Um, fascinating, complicated play. Um, hard to really get your head around, just so many parts of it. Um, and the caretaker, I have mixed feelings about the caretaker, but the caretaker is another interesting one with that sort of really, really complicated power dynamic is three male characters. Um, so it doesn't quite have that, um, that whole dynamic of the male gaze, like I talked about in the last, in the last, uh, episode, they, you know, all, all of the, all of the, the, the father and the brothers and Teddy too, arguably, all look at Ruth with the, as an object and she ends up flipping it all around and turning them into objects. Um, just fascinating, fascinating play for sure. Um, spoiler alert for the end of that one, but it's still the journey of that one is intense and crazy and fascinating. Um, but this one, the caretaker, um, two very, very different sort of characters starting it off, um, and this is an interest. One of the things I want to talk about with Jack Kirby um, next episode. Uh, is just the role of influence versus ripping something off versus, um, you know, the whole spectrum of how closely one piece follows another piece. And the caretaker, the criticism, this is such a strange criticism, but the criticism of the caretaker when it first came out was critics, a lot of critics said, I like this the first time I saw it when it was called Waiting for Godot. And it has no similarity to Waiting for Godot, except a lot of the dialogue sort of plays out in a similar sort of a way. Um, but that was, you know, arguably of anything that really connects the theater of the absurd writers. It's just the nature of the dialogue is similar. Um, the elliptical dialogue, um, just full of... Uh, Intense subtext, and you get that with Waiting for Godot, but there's really nothing similar about this in Waiting for Godot other than just it has the complicated character dynamics. Um, uh, but it starts off with Aston and uh, Davies or Davis, which is a Welsh name, and I heard that that was pronounced Davis. Not not to nitpick on the pronunciation, but I heard that it was pronounced Davis, but it's spelled Davies, and I do hear it actually pronounced Davies sometimes. Um, Donald Pleasance played played it in Davis at one point. In the uh, oh, in one of the one of the movies, um, which I, I'll talk about horror movies eventually. Donald Pleasance, just an amazing horror movie actor for sure. Alan Bates and Robert Shaw were also in it. Uh, but Aston, um, Aston says, "Sit down." Davies or Davis says, "Thanks." Oh, just a minute. Sit down, huh? I haven't had a good sit down. I haven't had a proper sit down. Well, I couldn't tell you. Here you are. Um, ten minutes off for tea break in the middle of the night in that place, and I couldn't find a seat, not one. Um, and it goes, and it, and 
Davis is, is racist, um, and so it goes into, you know, some racist bits of dialogue. And so, and this was written in um, 1960, um, so, you know, it might have been a very different context in 1960, I'm not sure, I mean, that's, there's something you'd have to consider, but in putting on a production now, um, certainly it's something, just reading it now and viewing it now, it's something that distances you from, um, from uh, Davies Davis. Um, so you sort of, um, you have Aston who's very quiet, um, and Davies who just won't stop talking. He's very, very manic and he's constantly talking. And he's very, he's very poor and you get, uh, you know, you get the impression that he's probably homeless. Uh, and he says these racist things, and so you sort of have a distance from him, just right from the beginning. Maybe, you know, from 2019 filtering, you have a distance from him, I don't know how differently it would have played um, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, but, um, but you have Aston, who's sort of just quietly listening to him, and Aston is pretty quiet throughout the whole thing. And then you have Mick who comes in um, and is as manic as uh, Davis or Davies. Um, and you get Aston talks about being in the insane asylum and you have, you know, Aston and Mick who sort of play out this manipulation of Davis and sort of treat him as this, this object of torture basically and sort of go back and forth. And manipulate his his loyalty to one or the other and they're sort of playing him against each other um and i don't know that you ever come around to really liking davies um he and i think probably that's one flaw of the 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 play is that he might be too flawed to really care about he does some horrible things um he betrays people very easily. You know, Davis is just Davies is just not a likable character, really, at all. Uh, and Mick and Aston are not really likable characters either. Um, but they create the sense of mystery. Like, what in the world are they even doing? Aston, I guess, is the most sympathetic. But you say, what what are they even doing? Um, and so, you know, just you see the opening dynamics of that one, and you say, um, uh. Aston and da Davies, uh, just sitting there, and Harold Pinter's listening to him, and you have this one really quiet character, and then this one really manic character, just blabbering constantly, um, and sort of discovering who they are, um, where they, where did they come from, and asking that same sort of question. Like I said with the parataxis, you set up this combination of things that don't seem to belong together, and you ask, why are they together? You set up these two characters, and here they're very different. Uh, in the Homecoming, they're very similar characters, but here they're very different. Um, so anyway, um, The Hot House is one, as I said, I don't really know that one, but it has a really compelling opening. I couldn't tell you how it actually plays out. Um, but I do want to read it eventually. I have so much on my reading list, but I do want to read it. Um, and it sort of reminds me of, uh, of some dialogue from, uh, from the, the interrogation scene of, of the birthday party. Um. And I, I quote it all the time, and I, I get the number wrong, but um, is, the, is the number 975 possible or necessary? And I'm always saying, is it possible or necessary, is, is what, I, what I'm most quoting from that one. But yeah, Root and Gibbs, um, and they sort of go back and forth. Gibbs, yes sir, tell me, yes sir. How's 6457 uh, six, getting on? Uh, he's dead, sir. Dead? He died Thursday, sir. Thursday? What are you talking about? What's today? Saturday. Saturday. Well, for goodness sake. Um, I had a talk with him. When was it? Recently. Only the other day. Yesterday, I think. Just a minute. I hardly think yesterday, sir. So it's a really compelling opening. I really want to read the rest of it. Um, but, like, what is even happening there? Um, it's a very Harold Pinder opening. This is from Grove Press, one of my favorite presses of all time. Just an amazing, amazing press. I think most of these are Grove. Yeah, most of these are Grove. Um, one of my favorite. I, I'll buy a book just because it's Grove Press. They're just an amazing press. Um, oh, let me do... I don't know. 
Ashes to Ashes has a great opening. I don't love Ashes to Ashes, but really not my favorite. It's sort of that later period. Um, Harold Pinter, where he sort of falls in the same groove of the interrogation. Um, the interrogation uh, trope that, that it's just constantly falling into. This is Devlin and Rebecca. Um, it's a really interesting opening. It's really compelling. It certainly drives you through. Um, uh, Rebecca says, uh, well, for example, he would stand over me and clench his fist, and then he'd, he'd put his other hand on my neck and grip it and bring my hand towards him. His fist grazed my mouth, and he'd say, kiss my fist. And did you? Oh, yes, I kissed his fist, the knuckles, and then he'd open his hand and give me a, the palm of his hand to kiss, which I kissed. So, that's intense. Um, usually with Harold Pinter, you'd have more of a slow build. Um, certainly with the homecoming and, and the caretaker, um, it just builds and builds and builds and gets more and more and more intense. And that's just, that's just, just jumps right in. Um, and it's a much shorter play, and I think the lack of build is partly what makes it just not really built for long term. Um, um, but anyway, <laughs> Moonlight, I don't really know that much about Moonlight. Um, Monologue. I don't know that much about monologue. But monologue monologue has an interesting opening. It's just one character, as the name implies. Um, but even that, you have um, um, I think I'll knit down to the games room, stretch my legs, have a game of ping pong. What about you, fancy game? How would you like a categorical thrashing? So it's still it's still two characters, but one's just invisible. One is, uh, one is an apostrophe. There is a real technical term for you. It's a monologue, but it is also an apostrophe. Um, and Moonlight, I like that cover. It was a Grove Press cover. Um, Grove Press, this, this is, this is kind of the classic, classic Grove Press cover. They did a lot of plays with that kind of cover. Um, this one's a more recent printing. Um, but it starts as, as a monologue, which is different from what it usually does. Uh, I can't sleep. There's no moon. It's so dark. I think I'll go downstairs and walk about. A very sort of clip. That clip sort of dialogue is very, very Harold Pinter. I won't make a noise. I'll be very quiet. Nobody will hear me. It's so dark. And I know everything is more silent when it's dark. But I don't want anyone to know I'm moving about in the night. I don't want to wake my father and mother. They're so tired. They have given sinners all their life, in fact, all their energies and all their love. They need to sleep in peace and wake up rested. I must see that this happens. It is my task because I know that when they, they look at me, they see that I am all they have left in their lives. That one starts really intensely. Um, sort of quietly and intensely. Um, and then Andy says... Uh, where are the boys? Have you found them? And Belle says, I'm trying. Um, you've been trying for weeks and failing. That's enough to make a cat laugh. Uh, do we have a cat? We do. Is it laughing? Bit the bust. What at? Me, I suppose. Why would your own dear cat laugh at you? That cat who was your own darling kitten when she was young, and so were you. That cat you have so da dandled and patted and petted and loved. Why should she? How could she laugh at her master? It's not remotely credible. So you have lines like that. I mean, it starts differently because it's with um, the monologue, which he doesn't normally do. Even in a play called Monologue, it is essentially dialogue. Um, but uh, he doesn't normally start with a monologue. Um, but that whole cat dialogue that comes right after that. It's a very typical sort of Harold Pinter sort of thing to do, where it's almost... You know, the, the technique sort of lends to the mood of a lot of the plays because um, it's almost like he's throwing these two characters in there and asking himself in the process of writing it, do these characters have a cat? And if the characters don't know if they have a cat, 
it creates this really mysterious sort of feel. So you can do this sort of technique. It's a great technique. Um, and I wonder if you kind of need a lot of experience doing something like this for it to really work and not let your conscious mind overtly control it and shape it so that um, it kills the, the spontaneity and the life of it. But, you know, you can certainly try this technique and you don't have to, you don't have to stick with this sort of unclear uh, world uh, that, that uh, you know, just two characters you throw in there randomly create, like not even knowing that you have a cat. Um, but you can jump right in there and they, maybe they know that they have a cat and you can, you know, you discover that through the, the dialogue. Um, Harold Pantry just keeps a lot of that in there, um, that sort of discovery. And it's characters discovering each other if they're strangers. Um, it's characters sort of uh, displaced from the reality of their own family's existence if it's, if it's a story of family members. Um, and so it's just a really effective, uh, technique, particularly for a certain mood, but, um, I think it really works for any sort of, any sort of a mood, um, really. Um, and so I'll do that, and this is sort of where it links to, it links to the previous episode, um, where I talked about, uh, casting characters that have... You know, I have hundreds and hundreds of characters that I really work with, and I sort of go back to them all, all the time, but um, sometimes I'll just, um, usually I start with parataxis, like with the, the exercises based on experience. I'll start with, you know, some sort of um, discontinuity of images um, that don't really seem to belong together, um, and try to work it out and create a story out of that. Um, but a lot of times I'll just, I'll have, um, I'll have that sort of image and then I'll throw maybe two characters in there. Um, and if I have a good idea about the characters, if I know who the characters are, they'll just start, they'll just start talking to each other. Um, and I've been told that, I've been told that, um, I have good dialogue and that's usually I interpret that because a lot of workshops are, are designed to enhance nonsense basically so you know you'll shape a lot of things in compliment sandwiches so you'll say i like your dialogue i didn't understand why this happened which is a useless comment um uh, i also liked how this character has green hair i don't know ran random things so compliment sandwiches will be two positive things that don't really matter and then a negative thing that doesn't really matter um but, uh, so yeah, that's, that was sort of the, the go-to compliment sandwich thing is you have a good dialogue. Um, you know, I know I was, I've been obsessed with uh, Harold Penner for years, so, um, I credit him with learning, learning a lot of that, but, um, but if you have two characters that you just throw in and let them just talk to each other, sometimes you'll just discover, um, you'll discover a story that way. Um, and so when you have, and, and the thing about Harold Pinter characters is that, uh, they're usually just one name and they're so mysterious that it's really hard to describe a lot of them really. Um, but for just, and that's one major difference is my characters, I tend, I always give them first and last names. Um, I give them mythologies and backstories and all that sort of stuff. So I'll take pre-existing characters and put them together, and then the dialogue will sort of just pop out of that. I'll just let them talk to each other. But the main thing, the main takeaway, and that's just my technique versus Harold Penner's technique, whatever technique you use, um, the main thing is is uh, let the characters live. So start with the the primordial primordial ooze at the core. Um, if you can see the green, there you go, green. Um, start with the primordial ooze at the core. Um, let, uh, let the characters become born out of that. Um, and then shape them however really optimizes access to that primordial ooze, to that, that living center. Um, but too much overt control can really kill it. And if you start off with too much conscious overt control over the, the, the living center of the story, um, that can keep you from progressing completely. So if you just let them live right from the beginning, 
and see where they take you and discover it. That's the delight of the storytelling. That's the delight of the creating the story. Um, but that'll make uh, that'll make it a whole lot richer and uh, uh, tonally complex and emotionally complex, just like a Harold Pinter story. So so emotionally complex. It's really hard to even describe what what the emotions actually are. Um, but anyway, I'll wrap it up for today. I'll see you on the next episode where I talk about something very very different. Jack Kirby, um, not as different as you might think, but but certainly different. Um, see you on the next episode.